Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. I am Ben Dietrich. Jordan Ridelli is on vacation, but Andrew Quo is here because he takes no days off. Andrew Quo, how are you? I feel amazing, man. I'm, I'm, the only reason I'm struggling to breathe is because how excited I am to do this pod today. My labored breathing <laughs> is a product of excitement and why, enthusiasm. Why are you excited, man? Because we have a fantastic guest. Yes! It's a long time coming. But she's finally here because she loves basketball, and she has some great <laughs> takes on whether Al Horford should remain part of the Sixers starting lineup. New Yorker writer extraordinaire. Nomi Fry is here. Hi, guys. Nomi. This is a dream come true for me. I've been really, like, working hard to get on the pod for the past, I don't know, year, I guess now. The amount of time you've spent poring over basketball reference, looking yes. at the minutia of the game and yes. then DMing us information yes, is finally paying off. It's really yeah. paying off. And um, yeah, basically, it's just my, my rebranding as a basketball guy is, is, is you know, just can been been building up this year. And this is like, finally, it's, it's exploding like a beautiful... <laughs> Um, you love to see it. You love to see it. Yeah. Like like a beautiful dunk. Like a beautiful <laughs> dunk. Sweet. Extreme so, energy. <laughs> Is that so, something you say in uh, basketball? <laughs> that's something we will start saying for okay. sure. Extreme energy in basketball. Yo, you yeah, watching the, this? Like, yeah, the extreme, <laughs> extreme energy. Extreme energy. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. What is your experience with basketball other than your love of the game? Okay. So my love of the game is great. Um, <laughs> my experience is nil. Uh, really. I will say, though, I'm going to reveal something that I don't think I've ever either revealed to you in our private conversations or revealed at all. Um that so as some of the listeners might know maybe I, I know a couple of the listeners most don't i'm uh, originally from israel and when i was growing up in israel in the 80s maccabi tel aviv was a really big deal in israel and it was like a very like patriotic act to to watch like maccabi basketball games and like you know i think in like 1970 nine maybe they won the european the europe cup or whatever it's called i don't even know but anyway it was a big deal and i was very into it actually in my childhood because it was a kind of like you know like everyone was supposed to be into it not because of the basketball so much but because of like the the force and strength of israel that you were supposed supposed to support um but then that kind of faded and since then i really haven't known anything about basketball except like i don't know just like the main the main players (laughs) and and, but recently in recent years um i've realized that basketball is is cool and so i've been trying to like fake my way through it and become like a fake basketball guy but in truth i really know nothing when yep. you put on the Cookies Hoops basketball hat, I yes. was convinced. I, I bought it. I was like, this woman <laughs> loves the game. So, I yeah, for the love of the game. So I have a good friend named <laughs> Brett who is a big basketball guy. And he is now endlessly making fun of me for, you know, like wearing the basketball hat and carrying the Cookies Hoops um, tote bag. And... Um, recently he accused me so whenever it was it was the first game in the in the finals i know this much that the lakers and the heat are facing off is that correct am i you right you now know as much as andrew and i okay so uh a few days ago whenever the first game was oh so i i should back up and say that when i was in la last year brett who is actually a big uh heat fan took me, he had tickets to a Lakers game and he took me to a Lakers game and it was my first, yeah, I think it was my first like real life basketball game to attend, like uh, um, definitely an NBA game. And 
I found it very exciting. And because I love Los Angeles, even though I live in New York, I was like, okay, maybe I'm a Lakers girl. Like maybe I should like get into being a Lakers fan. Mm. And so I had that thought for a little bit. It didn't go far, but I had sort of like feelings about it. And I was like, okay, maybe this is it. Maybe I'm getting into it. Like Larry David was yep. in in the audience. You know, I, I, the, the whole thing was very exciting. And I was like, okay, maybe I found a new identity. But it didn't go far. Like I didn't really develop it. And then the, before mm, the game, before the, the first- would have been perfect. I know, but- N- so Now was, look at you after a- <laughs> long arduous journey as a fan your team would be in the finals right? no i know it could have been so, a day one so that i know i could have been a day one so the thing was so before the game the first game um against the heat oh and so brett is a big heat fan and i talked to him before the game and i said well like something like you know good luck tonight or like i hope the heat win or something like that and he got he was very acted very taken aback and he was like but i thought you were a lakers girl oh, and wow. i said well i i don't know i mean i'm trying i'm like you're my friend and i want to support you <laughs> i i also want your team to win so i was i think and he told me that i was flip flopping and very confused about fandom and i need to like you know sit down and learn stuff before i to me that sounds very sportswoman like just I know. Wish, wishing the opponent Best exactly. Luck, you know? Exactly. Shake I, hands. Yeah. Go out there and do your best, Miami Heat and my Lakers. Who exactly. I've loved for year on end. Exactly. I just, you know, basically, I, I, yeah, that's a nice way to look at it. I think basically, I don't care that much, mm-hmm. and I just, I mean, probably I would. I guess my 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 commitment to my friendships is stronger than my commitment to my supposed team. Yeah. I which should, oh, shout sorry, out. Go ahead. Shout out to Brett, who I've never met, but sounds like a great guy. But I think you're an adva- advanced fan, and I'd like to be where you are because I have not, being a Knicks fan, I have not cared about the outcome of an NBA game for decades. Oh, right. right. And it is awesome. <laughs> Wait, but, but so, okay, so, Quo, you're a Knicks guy. Day one. And, and Dietrich, what's your, what's your, uh, I almost wanted to say band. What's your team? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, name three of your favorite Philadelphia 76ers. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I like I like Philly, and it's at this point Philly are, and Knicks fandoms are kind of dovetailing in there. And are you saying? Would you say that you're a day one? You're a day one Phillies. Oh, uh, for sure. Day one okay. Heat. Day one Lakers. Day one Knicks. Day one Sixers. <laughs> wow. And okay. Phillies. So I okay. have I have an anecdote about. Is it is it Maccabee? How do you? What's yeah, the correct well, in Hebrew you say Maccabi. Um, Maccabi. I'll, yeah. I'll try to use that because I have a Maccabi basketball story. Oh. Of my own. Oh. Okay. Despite not being Jewish. Okay. So I've told this on the show before, so I'll make it brief. But it's for your pleasure here. Okay. Is that when I was at the local JCC growing up? Okay. Well, my family belonged. I was really around. is is mm-hmm. that was that was that like a thing that like non Jews were? Um. It JCC? was. It was not a thing in terms of like a large percentage of the people who right. were members but there were certainly some you know like myself and was it a was it a community where there were many yes jewish it, people yeah the community was i would say more than half jewish and Interesting. the jcc was the best place to join a gym that had a pool I see. and a place to play basketball etc so it was for the love of the game it was for, it was for the love of the game. Rather than for the love of Moses. <laughs> little of A, little of B. Okay. Moses Malone. So I, I was in there. So I was in there. I was in there shooting around. How old are you at this point? I would say I was about thirteen or fourteen. Okay. Young. I played, I played on the Maccabi teams. Oh, for, so they were those were like JCC teams that 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 was like the, the I, yeah name I played like, I played wow. on on the JCC team. Oh my God! And, and would you say David. you were better than the Jews or worse than the Jews? I think it was a mix. Okay. You know, I, let's just steer clear that entire conversation. <laughs> okay. But I, I had a, you know, we had the Did star. You give of David. him buckets, Ben. I, I, I probably gave him some buckets. <laughs> but there, I had a star of David, you know, on, on my jersey. Okay. But I, I was in the gym shooting around, and this very tall gentleman walks in, and he's an <gasps> older guy, and he says. Oh, you're pretty good. Do you want to come and play in Israel? No. In the Maccabi games. 
but and like, like in the but but as a serious offer or just like, sort of yes so this guy was Dolph Shays I think NBA, I remember that the, name an NBA Hall of Famer who passed away a few years ago but NBA Hall of Famer probably the most famous Jewish basketball player of all time wow he's in the NBA Hall of Fame like he's ridiculously good he's a legend wow and I was like, yeah, of course I'd love to go play basketball in Israel. And he's like, you're Jewish, right? And I was just like, no. <laughs> and he just kind of turned and walked. Out. He turned uh. on his heel and he said, forget you, Goy. Uh, an unchosen person. Um, wow. This is, that's an amazing story. Um, well, you it's, were so it's close. It's rare I get a chance to talk. Maccabi basketball. So I'm glad that's why you're on the show. I wanted Maccabi basketball. Yeah. Chit-chat. Now it's all now it's all becoming clear why the, <laughs> the reason. Um, wow, that's that's a great story. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. What could I mean, have been, man? No hard feelings, you know. It, it was it, <laughs> to it, the it, nation it, of know. Israel. <laughs> <laughs> ben, ben, you didn't want it enough, man. If you wanted it enough, you would have been like, well, yes, I, I will convert to Judaism, and you would have gone over and had a successful career in Israel. I feel like there would have been some paperwork, but I, you know, (laughs) interestingly, interestingly, when I was in, so I, I went to undergrad in Tel Aviv university. Uh, this was before I came to the States to go to grad school. And one of my, and I studied English and one of my professors was a former Maccabi basketball player, uh, who was weirdly not Jewish. His name was Bob Griffin, and he was, I think he was pretty good. Like in the, in he came in the late seventies to play, and then I think his, I guess his second love was like English literature, and he just pivoted to being a professor. I'm Isn't looking that crazy. Through, he was smart. I'm looking yeah. through these rosters. There's some ballers. Ben, did you know Tom Chambers played a season in Maccabi, and Anthony Parker played years. So Only you're saying Caspi. that I, I could have lived the dream. I, I, I could have been Tom Chambers too, more Chambers. <laughs> I don't want to denigrate your life choices, but you could have been <laughs> Omri Caspi too. You could have been a man. contender. How, <laughs> how tall are you, Dietrich? 6'2". Six 6'2". Two. Six two. Is, like, is that like extremely short in like basketball <laughs> world? You'd be a guard. I would say it's at the lower level of acceptable height. Yeah. Like there are six foot two players on every team, but they are the smaller guys. Yeah. But you're lightning quick, so you make up for that. Well, well my leaping ability and my incredibly long arms. <laughs> <laughs> You've long in a monkey like arms. Um, my husband, Ohad, also an Israeli, uh, is six four, actually, I should say. Did this he is give him a, buckets? This is, um, I don't know what buckets are. Oh, is he good at basketball? <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I, I think I, my I, brain is broken. <laughs> is he good um, at playing the game of basketball? <laughs> is, so there's this game, basketball. Is he is he good at playing it? Yeah. Um, I think he was never like extremely. I think he was like you know, g- goodish because he was tall. But I don't think he was ever like great. You know, like Would um, you say he was a problem. No, I don't think it, he was a problem. <laughs> was he a wandering basin? Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is just regular talk, right? Yes. We're just talking here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. He was never like a big, a big player. He's, 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 he's more. Um, he plays a pretty good game of squash. I mean, not this isn't this is a, isn't about my husband. I'm just, I'm just, you know. Well, he turned this into a wonderful a squ- artist. This is a squash so. yeah. podcast too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He chose my life path, and I'm he chose your life it. path. It's true. Yeah. yeah, you are both artists. I gave up the yamming. I gave up giving up buckets, and <laughs> me and Ohad are painters now, and we're better for it. Yes, true. Arguably, <laughs> we don't know that for a fact. True, true. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so th- this is we we wandered off into the Maccabi. Uh, I love it. The streets Maccabi wanted that, and, and perhaps they needed it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yes. One thing before we get to our labored breathing president <laughs> you're headed to los angeles later this week and i, I feel I like you talk a lot about la there's a little yeah. bit of a, of a fixation on the I'm so-called relentless. city of angels <laughs> yes what's, what's up with that 
I don't know. I mean, I've I feel like I've I've gone on a variety of pods um, and have been asked this question. And I'm trying, I've tried in the past to pinpoint what it is exactly that I like. I know that when I meet people who I'm kindred with, where I, we have like similar, you know, cultural interests and, um, and so on, pop cultural obsessions, and they don't like Los Angeles, it always is, really surprises me because to me it's just so like essentially fascinating and like seductive. Um, I just feel like it's very different than I am. And that's always like been, it's, it, it reveals to me a world that I know can't really be mine. Although of course I should say that this is completely like mythical. Of course, Los Angeles can be a million different things and a million different people can find a variety of like, you you know, aspects of it your own Los Angeles. Yeah, of course, of course. This is more of a c- c- kind of I've never lived there, I should say. I've only visited, you know, many times, but I um the kind of mythical idea of this like uh place that is a uh, kind of like beautiful landscape-wise, uh weather-wise but that is there is something also that's kind of a little bit rotten about it is very <laughs> interesting to me you know i love um, scammers i love all scammers and they all seem to live in la yes i think it's a very scammy city it's a city of liars <laughs> and um i, I love it i, love I don't it. think i wouldn't want to like i'm always like pretending that i'm on the verge of like you know, defecting to Hollywood, quote unquote, when, when in fact there's no, there's absolutely no reason for me to do it. And also there's no like opportunity for me to do it. So it's like a complete like fabrication on my end of being like, yeah, I'm going Hollywood because it's just like the idea of it is so funny to me because it's so like, I'm such like a, you know, kind of like a stooped, like conflicted Jew. And the idea of me just like parading you know, around LA, it's just it's just inherently comical. <laughs> um, but I think just I, I've always been, yeah, I've just always been interested in this like uh, kind of sleek fake sheen that the city has. Would you say your infatuation with Los Angeles is similar to that of a French person, or is it just the proximity to say like the TikTok house? Uh, you mean the fact that French people like LA, like you, like they love LA, yeah, for like a very, very sp- yeah. specific reason. The sort of old Hollywood lounging by the pool, yeah, like chateau, yeah. I mean, that- yeah, I think so. I mean, I you know, I can't purport uh, to imagine what a French person thinks or feels because <laughs> that's another. That's Do another. It. Do uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What if I break out like a horrible like impression of a French person now? Like Sounds really like offensive. Something, that's something that's happened on this show Zutador. many, many times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just think it's very well. It, it's maybe it's a little bit more complicated because like um, landscape wise, flora wise, all of that, it's actually much closer to Israel than New York is. Um, So there is something about it, and climate-wise as well, um, there is something about it that that does remind me of like the landscape of home in a weird way. Mm. Um, So when I go there, I'm like, oh, like these are all like flowers and shrubs and, you know, trees that I grew up with. And that feels kind of nice, I think. But I think it's more than that. It's the absolute... Um, the absolute uh, opposition between me and the place that's very attractive to me. Yeah, I the think. thing the thing I enjoy about your your LA fixation on Twitter is like I I grew up in New York, and there was like I was a big fan of grew up with Seinfeld, grew up with Woody Allen, all right. this like uh, Jewish humor, you know. Yeah. And then there's LA, which seems like diametrically opposed. And when I go there, I just feel insanely out of place yeah the way i dress the way i talk the way yeah. I, you know i just exist out there and i'm just like oh, i grew up on like 
like the New Yorker, <laughs> New York Times, yeah. you know, it's just like uh, culturally it's there's always like a big city elitism and i'm like well new york is the best obviously and yeah I go to la i'm like you guys are pretty cool too and i don't understand you at all what am i missing you know yeah yeah i mean i just think there is something there is something about kind of the on the noseness of 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 the what i feel when i'm there where i'm like oh yeah this is exactly you know like if you're in like I, again, I don't know if this is something that I would want to actually live in because I think then I would just feel alienated, mm -hmm. um, you know, which I, I'm not interested in feeling on like a regular basis. I think I would probably feel like rejected in some ways, but this way, if I just like come in and go out and it's, and it, it's, it's another thing is that it's just my life in New York is pretty, you know, I'm, I'm like, I have a family, like I have a daughter and I work, my work is, you know, I like my work, but I work pretty hard probably, or at least it's maybe not that hard, but it's like hard on me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just that. like, it's just like hard on me emotionally and intellectually, I guess, to sort of like pr produce, to keep on producing when I need to produce and um, writing wise. And so I feel like it's, it's a chance for me to go and just be like, kind of like a dumb bitch for like a little bit, you know, which I, I'm just not used to. And it's, and it's not like I do anything particularly dumb or bitchy, you know, but it's just, it's a way to sort of release a little bit. Um, That's how I feel about Twitter. But I hear you, <laughs> That's man. How you feel about Twitter. I'm like, it's time for me to be a dumb bitch, for yeah. sure. And I'm like, <laughs> pounding these keys, you know. <laughs> pound, pound. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. Like, I feel like New York and LA are becoming a little bit more like each other. And okay, do you think it's because of the outdoor dining? <laughs> no, I, I think that's part yeah. of it. I think the outdoor dining is part of it. I think everyone using cars now is part of it in New York City. That's I, interesting. And I think it was headed that direction anyway, especially in terms of New York spreading out and, you know, whatever. So yeah. Years ago, oh, that's you interesting would spend your thing. entire evening beneath 14th Street in Manhattan. Like hanging out in yeah. the boroughs was just an, a... It wasn't something you did. You might yeah. go to the, a local bar and have a beer, but you didn't make a night of hanging in the neighborhood. You went into Manhattan. You went into lower Manhattan. You went into the 20s. You went to the meatpacking. But in general, it was all lower Manhattan, every single social thing. And you'd bounce around and bounce around. And now it might be Greenpoint, Gowanus, Bushwick, Ridgewood. Um, the Lot Radio. The, city, the Lot Radio. <laughs> But it's all over the place. And I, I know. feel like that Ben is, is like, come to the lot. I'm like, hells no, that's an hour away, man. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think we've, we've, it's segmented a bit in the same way that Los Angeles is by different Neighborhood neighborhoods yeah. where you actually have to travel. And especially in a social context, it's not something where you would say, go and catch the subway to go from Bushwick to Tribeca at 1.30 in the morning. Like yeah. you are where you are. Yeah. So I, I think there's been a sort of segmentation of the neighborhoods in New York in terms of, I guess, almost communities in the same way that in Los Angeles you might have, okay, here's Silver Lake, you know, here's yeah. Glendale or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I mean, mean I, guess when I, I guess when I go there, for me, because, yeah, because I don't, um, I, I don't have to be at work. Or, you know, like if I go or sometimes I go for work, actually, the last few times I've gone for work. But still, it's a little bit different. Like I'd go and like do a story or something. So it's it's not like my usual schedule. And so I would probably go. I would probably drive out from the east to like, you know, West Hollywood. Like it wouldn't be a big deal for me because I have more time. But I think people who live there, like I'm never seeing you again if you live like, you know, if you're in the East and your friend lives in the West or, or whatever the case, you know, Have um, you bounced. Oh, sorry to cut you off. I was just, no, no, no. I was just out of curiosity as someone who's not a, a, a native of the United States. Do you outside of New York and Los Angeles, have you gone to like Miami, New Orleans? Have you checked I've out? never been to New Orleans. I've been to Miami a few times, maybe th three or four times. Um, and I haven't been, yeah, I haven't traveled that extensively 
within the states. Well, I did. I should say, although it's it, it's still coastal, but I the my history with America is that I um, I you know I'm Israeli, but my dad worked in the states off and on when I was growing up. So I did spend time as a child with my you know original family of origin. I did spend time, and that was always in Seattle. We were always. Um, oh. going back there because that's where my dad worked at University of Washington. So um, my experience in America actually began in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the first, like, you know, I, I would go with my parents um, every other summer and I, we spent a couple of years as well um, going there until I was like, I stopped going when I was, 16 i guess were these the grunge years those were the grunge years oh my god amazing you were there (laughs) i was there yeah those were yeah i mean i mean partly it was the grunge years i started going there in the 80s but yes i mean when i was i spent a year there when i was in ninth grade uh 1991 yeah Yeah, so that was actually really it, it was but i was so you know i was like 15 and i was sheltered and also, I didn't. I I had only come for a year, mm. and um, and so I didn't. I feel like in retrospect, like I feel like culturally, it was like incredibly important to me, and and I. But in terms of like on the ground experience, it wasn't like I was like thrashing in the clubs. <laughs> did you get any like? <laughs> how was the drip? Like, did you? Get yes. the flannel? Did oh, you get yeah. the torn jeans? Hundred percent. Yes, all of it, all of it. Yeah. If you look, if you see pictures of me, if you you like looking those. at pictures of me from <laughs> like ninth grade or tenth grade, um, it's it's like full on, like a it's like a comedy. You know, it's like just like again, like so on the nose, just like like Who's a band, your band? Like, like like a band T shirt. You know. Uh, yeah. I just uh, flannel yeah. docks. My fr- the first docks I got actually were low top, um, <laughs> and they were yeah. you know that sort of like ox blood like wine color. Yeah, you know. I just watched the Mud Honey documentary and there's a Mud Honey documentary. It there is and Mark it is, Arm, <laughs> Mark Arm, who still. Uh, <laughs> Ben, he's the lead singer of a band called Mud Honey. I, I mean, I've heard of Mud Honey, <laughs> <laughs> but they had one hit, right? Like "Touch Me, I'm Touch Sick." Touch me, I'm sick. Yeah, which was a great song. And he still packs records for mail for ma- in the shipping department at Sub Pop Records. And really? Yeah, and it's kind of like uh, it's a it's a joyful documentary, but it's men- melancholy because you know he's he's in recovery, and oh, that's good. I mean, yeah, he's I'm doing glad great. He's, yeah. But you know, the I feel I feel like the the stories are always like what could have been. All these documentaries, like they had the biggest hit. I'm totally. Like, I mean, they were cool, but like they were bluesy. I so I'm allergic to the blues. So I'm not a big blues person myself. I don't know many people who are, and I think we accept <laughs> it too much. Like when I hear a blues solo, I should speak out. <laughs> Wait, are we talking about like JD and the Sure Shot here? <laughs> like. New York City's the ultimate most blues band. The ultimate. Uh, Nomi, the the owner of the Knicks, the amazing, tremendously mm-hmm. successful owner of the Knicks. His main passion is his blue blues band called JD and the Straight Shot. Oh wow! Oh, straight, straight, straight shot, straight shot, straight well, shot. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of the blues and the grunge years, yes. I feel like updating that to today. Yeah, this is a this is a sloppy segue into talking about. Our labored breath, our labored <laughs> breathing. <laughs> He's got those breathing blues, man. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't know what's happened this morning. Is there anything new to report? My last I, not that week. I know. I mean, although maybe in the 29 minutes that we've been talking, maybe he's, you know, risen either <laughs> like, you know, went to the balcony again, or maybe he's uh, in his chambers uh, struggling to, to breathe. You know, I mean, who knows what's happening? What has Claudia Conway broken in the last 29 <laughs> minutes? So I, the last thing I saw was my friend Rehan sent me a tweet where you see, I guess it's from, I'm not on TikTok, so I don't like follow Claudia on TikTok. So I get it all from like secondary 
uh, you know, sources. Right. Like if Tick, it's on Twitter TikTok or on Instagram, and somebody sure. s- sends me. Um, it was something where Kellyanne, where you see Claudia sort of talking to the to the camera, and then you off screen you hear. Kellyanne saying, you're taping again? Are you taping me again? Stop <laughs> fucking doing that. You're like, you're like, you're fucking, you fucking lied about COVID or something like that. There's like, it's a real like Jerry Springer <laughs> family, family moment. But I think this kid is a hero. Like she's incredible. Or I mean, she's a grifting scammer just like her parents. Ugh. I mean, as long as she's grifting against them, I don't care. I mean, like, whatever, just like I I'm, I'm willing to believe the teens. I'm yes. just saying there is a lineage here of grifters. And now they're just all over the, the political spectrum grifting away. Yeah, I guess you're right. A coven of clout demons. It's a coven of clout demons. Yeah. I mean, she is interesting to me because, first of all, she can you believe she's 15? It's like kind of. In that, in that, like she is involved in a world that is for adults, or no, she in that she younger? looks thirty-five. Oh, she does, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. No, I just mean physically. She's very. She looks very uh, adult. Um, and I'm not just talking about like her body. I'm just talking about her whole manner, look, and you know her. They say face TikTok and... adds twenty-five years. I yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what they say. I don't wanna... <laughs> So it, it certainly looks like it. She looks very, she looks like a full grown woman. Yeah. Is, and yeah. Are, are these 15 year olds advanced? Like TikTok, she's probably more fluent in social media than we will ever be. The yes. three of us combined. Yeah. And, and is there a fluidity there that is just like advanced? So when she's just speaking off the cuff and her mom is like, turn that fucking thing off. Is there like a bigger disconnect than just like uh, uh, snitching? Is this like a use of media that is going to just seem very normal really quick? You mean just that this sort of thing, like uh, uh, kind of uh, divorced from the political <laughs> context, will just yep. be happening with moms and dads and kids soon? Yeah. It's probably and- happening. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm still my daughter Nina is nine and she still doesn't have a phone and you know so we're a little bit pre this moment I know it's going to be bad probably so maybe I you know it'll be it'll be funny to see myself as the kind of like I mean not funny it'll be a tragedy but to see myself as the kind of like (laughs) parent who who's who gets caught on screen is like the asshole like dork you know (laughs) maybe what I meant was like uh you know I, I love this Claudia Conway stuff. And yeah. There is a bit of pearl clutching a little bit on my feed, being like, she's only 15, she's doing this on TikTok. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, but this is as legit as, like, the CNN report. You know, oh, like, yeah. No, no, no. I'm supportive of that. I mean, I think yeah. in this context, it's absolutely imperative that we have someone in the house. <laughs> yes, like, I, right. I am really into it. And if she is overhearing things that her like fucking moron parents and like you know morally bankrupt like you know mother they are talking about and she's like oh you know she overhears them saying that in fact like the country is being lied to and the president is not like making like an incredible recovery and you know what have you then then yes s- spill that tea sis well this is this is the <laughs> as toxic. the kids say <laughs> This is the toxic information ecology in a nutshell here where we don't believe anything that's coming out of the White House. We don't believe anything that's coming from the doctor who's up there basically just, you know, running cover for whatever is happening. So there's no reason to suggest that, say, Claudia Conway is less reliable. Totally. In fact, she's probably more reliable. Like I'm I am also very into her aesthetic, like. I mean, apart from the fact that she looks much older than her years, if you look, uh, yesterday I followed her on Instagram. Since I don't have TikTok, I'm like, okay, although she doesn't seem to be posting much. uh, um, So you're inching closer and closer to TikTok. Yeah, I'm inching closer. I I followed her and then I looked at her pictures. um, And it's a very like, you know, like I'm going to say it, it's a very kind of like a slutty 
like you know kind of teen slut like jersey slush jersey shore you know like fake tan like tiffany like necklace um just like just straight iron blonde hair like i'm 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 very in, like ton of makeup like i'm kind of into her being a truth teller while having this like teen aesthetic you know um i i think i just think this is it's it would be like kind, kind of coming perfect like circle you know to have this particular type of teen you know rather than like I don't know, like a dour, like gothy, you know, <laughs> vegan Knicks or fan. something. Nick's yeah. fan, yeah, yeah, yeah. with um, like glasses. I'm, I'm sort of into the fact that she's so trashy looking. Yeah. I mean, no, no offense, Claudia. This is all like, I'm, I like, I, I'm saying this with love, you know, mm. like I support yeah. it, not trashy yeah. in a bad way. I just like it, you know. Yeah. I, I think it's cool. I wanted like the deep fake technology to play a bigger role in the shenanigans leading up to the election. <laughs> no, and, no. And, oh, I was expecting it, and it's... I thought like maybe this Claudia Conway was like a concoction of like an adult version of a fifteen-year-old. Because right. you're right. I look at her, I'm like, oh, I'm so disconnected from fifteen-year-olds. Yeah. Naturally, that I don't recognize them. Right. Anymore. It's like who even knows like what it <laughs> looks like now? You yeah. know. Maybe they yeah. do all look like 35, like, and they're from, True. like, the Real Housewives of OC. You know? I mean, who knows? You know, Very I'm, influential. I'm, yes. And, and also, we got to remember, she's living where? In D.C.? D.C. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, I don't know what the difference is between, say, like, a New York teenager, a D.C. teenager, an L.A. teenager. I assume there's some sort of composite American teen who is... Yeah. 15 years old and maybe she represents that I have no clue but the yeah. other thing is oh yeah sorry. no 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 I just wanted to say that you know again since I'm not on TikTok but I keep you know people post TikToks on Instagram or like on Twitter or whatever I see TikToks and I'm like my impression is it, it terrifies me because I'm like wow are all the teens now like geniuses I'm mm. like I'm like is this what we're like because it seems so re removed from what I remember of teens <laughs> that I'm like, am I really incredibly out of touch? And I just don't know that like the new generation is just like, they're all like just brilliant. I'm convinced that no one over, over 40 is cool. And that's very depressing. Quo. <laughs> I, I'm sticking by it. And... Okay. I mean, it's probably, you're probably right. So like, what should we do? Embrace our uncoolness. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Uh, is it that that is also like a form of being cool? It's it's a real catch uh, me too. Uh, this is getting sticky. Yeah. Um. It's. I think the thing that is makes me rest easy is knowing that I don't understand young people. I'm like, oh, this is how I felt as a young person. You yeah. old heads don't understand me. I'm like, time is working, and everything else is seems yeah. to be falling off the rails, but. I didn't expect 15 year olds. I don't expect 15 year olds to all resemble Claudia Conway, but maybe they do. I'll never know. But this is the issue, right? Because when Nomi says, I don't know what it's like to be French, we're like, that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, she's never been French. Yeah. But when we say, I don't understand the kids, but we've all been young. So that's, that, that's a, a little bit different. It's not like being a different gender it's not like being a different race it's not like being a different religion and growing up that way we were all young once every single one of us spent at least a year of their life as a 15 year old <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah so like we do actually know what it's like but we don't know what it's like now and yeah. maybe we forgot but i do think there are some universals and you can see those kind of things happening it might be more of like a skill set and just to make a quick basketball analog because oh, wow. we all love basketball Ooh. here oh yeah especially me a, a six foot eight guy who grew up playing basketball 20 years ago would not be expected to be a good shooter or a good ball handler that guy today those would be the expectations that come with that position you have to be able to shoot threes you have to be able to dribble so i view tiktok and social media a bit in that same category mm. where it's like this is a skill set that you develop like, maybe you're not as good at sm as smoking cigarettes, you know? Maybe you're not as good at hanging out and doing nothing as yeah. we were yeah. back when we were teenagers. But you're better with cutting a 30-second clip where you do six different voices in your bathroom. Right. 
Yes. Now, right. who had more fun? <laughs> who had more fun? Who had the cigarettes? Who had the cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> I right, mean, so I, I have to say that I find it, as a, as a mother to a daughter, I shouldn't be saying this, and I, I if, you know, in, in my own home, I'm sure I'll change my tune, but I, when I see teens smoking, I feel like, okay, like, everything is okay. Like, I'm like, <laughs> everything is right <laughs> in the world. Right. Go, go forth, just do, keep, keep on, you know, just do the same, like, shitty, fun stuff. <laughs> you know, and and it's it's like the, the 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 world keeps on turning. You know, it's uh, and when uh, I would see really young people at like a V Files party, and everyone was just on their phone, and no one was drinking or, or seemingly attempting to woo people, uh, um, seduce them yeah. back yeah. home for imp- you know indecent activities. They were just on their phones, taking photos of each other, live streaming. And I was like, man. This is kind of a bummer. But then you see the young skater kids like breaking bottles and, and you know, <laughs> parading around Dime Square, staggering. And you're like, OK, the, the kids are all right. I know. It's very it's very it's very reassuring because it I think it reassures us that we still know what's going on. You know, we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I recognize this. This isn't it's I remember this. In fact, I still like sometimes do this kind of thing, you know, maybe not breaking bottles, but certainly smoking cigarettes. You know, so it's Stag- like staggering around Dime Square, staggering around Dime Square, like throwing up. Like, I, ha- I have this big uh, my culture is not a costume feel when that yes. happens because I'm like, oh, here are you in your Stone Temple Pilots T-shirt. <laughs> With your fanny pack, breaking <laughs> bottles. My culture is not a costume, you know. <laughs> totally, yeah. I feel In that. your squared. favorite Blind Melon song. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw, speaking of Blind Melon, it's like we're really getting in the weeds here, but I saw that there was like a Shannon Hoon documentary coming out. It's like really oh, because you, that, were, yeah. you were talking about like Mark Arm and how, and then it's just like all of these figures – Another figure that I, it wasn't a documentary, but that I went deep on like a couple months ago is Mark Lanigan from the uh, of course. Screaming, Screaming Trees. Trees. So he too is in recovery. Apparently mm-hmm. the man who helped save his life is Duff McKagan, my king. What? Yeah, He's, he wow. he gave him, a, he knew him from Seattle, I think. And mm-hmm. he was, I guess he was really, really a bad junkie. Mark Lanigan was in, um, he was like, in a very bad way and I think Duff gave him like a job like some sort of like handyman job and let him live in his house in LA when he was like away or something and it really helped turn him around I've always liked Duff I've always liked Duff but also you brought up the Screaming Trees I wonder where the two other guys are from. you mean Van uh, (laughs) what was his the Van Connor Van and the other brother the Connor brothers yeah (laughs) well this is really like deep cuts um i don't know but i think i think there was a break in that band and that they no longer talk like i think there's no i think there was some sort of uh some sort of uh rift if i remember correctly because that was an interesting band to me because visually they were awesome they were two body positive guys not unlike Nikola Jokic and Luka Doncic and like (laughs) you're you're you know, they were flanking Lanigan, who was like the skinny, t- stereotypical, you know, rock and roll singer. And then Lanigan ends up going to make records with a Bell and Sebastian affiliated artist. And they do a couple records, right? He, I think he was, I, I had one, I believe I even had it on, I possibly had it on tape. Wow. You guys. Wow. Uh, Uncle Anesthesia, hmm. the, the Screaming Trees, uh, tape and um i have been known to occasionally dip into it uh Whoa. recently after somehow coming like some youtube like rabbit hole brought me to lanigan and i hadn't thought about them for many years and that um is a very it's a it's a it's a good it's a good album yeah they had jams and it's back right like grunge is is it over is, was, did it come and go? Did I miss it? Quo, you always have this thing. I love it. Uh, You're like, okay, our tie dyes are back. Are they still back? Are they over? Are they forever? Are they eternal? I'll never know. Uh, boot cup jeans. Did they actually come back? Oh, please, yes. no. I hope not. Well, but it's je- like they 
uh, they came back, but no one's sure if they actually came back. Yeah. And then if they're already came back and already left. I think it's just micro cycles now, you know, like mm. it's like things are so quick um, that although tie dye is actually very long, but um, that's not going anywhere. It's and, not going anywhere. Yeah. Well, um, one, one, one thing that I want your opinion on is and I think this is a good emblematic of, of these micro trends and then how they all end up overlapping is the cuffs on women's pants. Okay. And I think we had like the frayed look. Then it went to wide frayed. Then it went to cut higher frayed. Then oh, it yes. went to not frayed at all. Where are we on, on the, okay, the frayed I, cuff spectrum I right think, now? okay, so I, I can't totally say where we are as a culture. I can talk to my own <laughs> preferences, which, you no, know. No, I'd prefer where we are as a culture. Okay, well, I, you know, I, I don't know that I... I mean, I will say that I, two years ago, I tried the high water frayed look. Mm -hmm. Respect. I remember that was like a, (laughs) that was like a thing. Now, Mm -hmm. thank you for reminding me because I totally forgot. And it was very hot for a second. And I tried. I remember it, it started small. It was like just the cuffs, just like hacked off with scissors. And yeah, then, which is what be, I did. Which is what yeah. I did. I just and, hacked and, it off myself. I didn't buy like a special like whatever made right. well. Then, then they started be- exactly. Then they yeah. started becoming distressed in that way. Yes. Then they started rising up and down like, like yeah. the tides. So 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 here's the thing. I don't respect it when it comes and maybe this is my grunge the legacy of grunge that's that's you know flowing through my veins like like you know sweet honey but i it's it's um i don't respect it when it and this is something that i felt i i feel like i might have felt this as early as seventh grade maybe there was this girl and she got uh this girl in my grade, and I remember she bought pants that had rips, like that had pre-made rips, like jeans, on the knees. And I remember thinking, that's so lame. Like I remember thinking at the time, and this was mm-hmm, before mm-hmm. I knew I, was, I wasn't cool, you know? But I, maybe in my heart, I was already like, okay, I have some ethics, I have some standards, this is like, you know, a bridge too far. And I've continued to feel this way. I just don't like it when things come pre- distressed or pre-ripped uh, or mean, pre-frayed. Like I, those, I would never buy that sort of thing. Like the Rolling Stones or Ramon shirts. So, okay, Anthony Bourdain, rest in peace, used to go on his show with like a brand new Ramon's beefy tee that he just bought from <laughs> St. Mark's Place, right? And he'd be like, yeah, the most badass band in the world. I'm like, ooh, yeah, right. But what do I prefer? Like a $200 vintage frayed Ramones tee yeah. or even one that's printed to look frayed. I'm like, oh no, yeah. that's horrible. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bad, you're, you know, you're right because it's like, it is, I mean, of course the answer would be to have the shirt from, but that would mean you're old. Right, <laughs> right, right. And or then we said willing, that old people aren't cool. This is a pred- so or I, so maybe they spend, are cool. Or you're know. spelling, spending hundreds of dollars on it. That's what I mean. Yeah, if if you're if you're like a younger person or a person who didn't happen to be at a Ramones show in like yeah. you know like 1978 yeah. or something, um, then then yes, it means you're spending a lot of money on it, which is also not cool. Yeah. I think what really helped me is I I decided not to care about authenticity ever. So okay. I it's this is a, a conundrum, right? Like I don't know what's better, a brand new beefy tea or something that was like off of a rack, right? That cost two hundred fifty dollars at ProSell. Yeah. Shout out but to But Maybe not caring about authenticity is a form of authenticity. This like we're is we're we're very wrapped confusing. in the you know, the the egg roll the burrito the of, burrito right. it's a it's a the ravioli yeah. taco the calzone. Of, of, of the real. Yeah. yeah. I think, okay, my, I guess my answer to that, or not, a, it's not an answer, but like, I mean, and this is again, something I've probably said on, on some of the other podcasts I've, I've guessed it on, you know, in my time, but I, <laughs> I think nice. it's good to just like be, you know, if you think about like wearing uh, like pretty cheap, 
classic things like I don't know like Converse All Stars or like Vans or Levi's or like a Gildan t-shirt or something and you don't have to worry so much about authenticity you know you don't have to worry about sourcing or about like heritage or Mm -hmm. expense because you're just the, the French model as well yeah, and I, you know, I'm exploring my Frenchness today. Mm, like jeans, this... white t-shirt. Yeah, or just, yeah, or just Chucks. some something that doesn't, um, that's pretty uniform, you know? And, uh, and then you don't have to get in the weeds with, like, the whole, like, okay, is this shirt, like, authentic enough or... Yeah. Did you I... actually, like, listen to the Ramones <laughs> when you were growing up or... <laughs> I do like so I'm going to contradict myself like I always do. Yes. I <laughs> I don't I try to break away from the idea of like authenticity, but I'm obsessed with it because it kind of forms like cultish corners yeah. in in places. And recently I've been trying to figure out like denim collectors cuz that oh, wow. seems like the farthest thing away from my brain I can think of and it seems cultish a little bit. I did yeah. some quick research, Google, and it was like people are paying thousands of dollars for these old jeans that like miners wore in the turn of the century. Yeah. I'm like, is this desirable stuff? It's like, yeah, authentic stuff on auction even. Like that that feels very two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Right. When everyone was concerned with not with like not washing your APCs and stuff. Right. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Like, just wear them every day, never wash them. Yeah. And I remember like, the first time I went to the, so I was still living in Israel, but I was visiting New York and I went to the APC store on Mercer and I got my first pair of APC jeans and I was very intimidated by the store. I was a country mouse <laughs> and I remember the the sales person said like, so you don't, don't wash them. And I was like, don't wash them. <laughs> yeah, totally weird, right? I've never heard of such a thing. What do but you that mean? That was a rule for like the denim nerds, like never wash your jeans. And then you'd take them off and your legs would be blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your socks, your white tube socks would be mm-hmm. blue on top. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like the contact. The con- right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, is it and, my circulation beneath the waist failing me or am I just wearing my new APCs? And it was so confusing because the APC would be like, and we'll buy them back from you. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm not going to wash these. They're going to be disgusting, and you'll pay money to take them back? And then we'll wash them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and double the price. <laughs> but this is my poor transition to cults and the Nexium documentary, right? Because oh, Denim yeah. Nerds and Nexium just happen right under our noses. And <sighs> sometimes it takes a show like on HBO, like The Vow, or How to Make It in America to expose these cults. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Peg Leg, the consultants on that show. Yeah, well, friends of the pod. Those guys are great. Um, yeah, the vow. So, Quo, you've been watching. Dietrich, you have not been watching, but you know what it's about. I mm-hmm. love all cults. I especially love documentaries about cults, and I especially like good documentaries about cults. And I'm this not is sure not the, one of them. The vow hits some notes, but it kind of is a little self-congratulatory. Oh, I my wish, God, like, yes. I wish Errol Morris got his hands on it or something. Oh my God, these people are losers. It's like, it's the, it's the worst because, okay, so it's a classic situation where like the, the people like that guy, Mark, right? The former (laughs) Nexium, like Lieutenant (laughs) or whatever he was, had this incredible footage, right? From years Mm -hmm. and years and years of talking and recording paranoically as well as, you know, the, the combination mm. of a sort of paranoia, like recording for posterity, the words of the master vanguard, mm-hmm. Keith mm-hmm. Ranieri, and also recording literally every conversation he's had, including with his wife, it seems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, it's there. And, you know, taping everything, like trying to make a, a movie about vanguard. So basically he had this footage that, you know, in order to make the documentary, the, the the directors needed. And so what we got, it seems, this is seemingly to me, is this, um, you know, this is a document that is completely focalized from the point of view of these uh, defectors, yeah. you know, um, but who 
I'm sh- surely, first of all, are idiots. Second of all, <laughs> seems are so. are kind of liars. It seems to me, or like let themselves off too easy, you know, for for, for being sure. from being in that cult and being kind of pretty powerful. It seems like money making um, cogs in that machine, you know. Yep, um, yep. And uh, and the movie doesn't really question them that much. The the, the series doesn't question them that much, and so we have to like see Mark's face um and sarah's face <laughs> and i feel bad for bonnie bonnie looks like gone you know she's mm-hmm. like she's stuck with mark <laughs> i mean does every cult just end up a sex cult with a compound is that the end game when you start your cult you're working towards that it's like a startup ben we end up staring at candles wearing latrell Sprewell jerseys take well, that back that's true of course but you know First, you want some you know, meetings. Then you got to have collecting some money. You got to have people kind of leaving their families. But ultimately, yeah. aren't you just trying First to get, you get the, the money. sex compound? First, <laughs> then you get the power. You get the money. <laughs> <laughs> then you get the sex compound. Then you get Eventually, the sex though, compound. Eventually, though, isn't, isn't that the goal of every cult, though? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a cult um, expert, but I did just... <laughs> Stop selling yourself short. <laughs> No, we, not, not you're yet. a cult expert. I did just read, um, read. Uh, an incredible, <laughs> an incredible biography of the Beach Boys from 1986, oh, yeah. Yeah. and it has it's really very interesting, and it has a long part about Dennis Wilson's uh, dalliance with the Manson family, and so certainly there, sex wasn't. I think sex wasn't. It didn't seem to be like the end goal, but it definitely was a recruiting mechanism and a perk. Right. You know, Mm. because like the way he got men into the cult, like so the way he hooked um, like, uh, you know, sort of like more influential people like Dennis Wilson, who had money and sort of supported them and was that he was traveling in a bus with like 12, like 16 year olds, you know, and was like they're yours kind of Mm -hmm. and uh and that's so it was it was kind of like a way to hook people but the end game was helter skelter Mm. (laughs) the end game was a race war yeah (laughs) it wasn't sex the end game was was a sexy race war of kevin love the basketball player whose father was the brother of mike love wait no. He's Mike. He's Mike Love's nephew. No. Mm. Wow. Wow. This Who's makes a the lot dad? Stephen Love or um, because the, because the documentary like Mike Love's not the documentary. Sorry, the book that I read has a lot about the Love family, obviously. And um, Mike Love's one of Mike Love's brother managed them for a long time. Stephen Love. His I wonder if father it's Kevin was Stanley Love. Oh, was Stan also Love. Well, a, uh, Stan, a basketball player. Wow, that's a, fantastic that's a rogue. That's actually a rogue. It, it's, you know, that family hated. Everybody hated each other so much, and there were so many fights about money and controlling Brian and all of that. And Stan was, in fact, um, like, uh, kind of Brian's sort of bodyguard slash handler for a pretty long time because Brian obviously was off the rails and somebody had to like, you know, take care of him and also like coerce him to do everything. So the band would continue to make money and fulfill its engagements because he was like so insane. Mm. Um, So that was Stan Love. Um, And I feel like there was some sort of extortion scheme at some point with him. Anyway, it's all connected. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. There we go. It's a bit... Oh, go, point, on, go on, Quill. What were you going to say? To your point, I just watched the the documentary about the Biosphere Two, and that oh. that's some, it's oh, good. M- more more biospheres. <laughs> yeah. So uh, wait, is it that prepper thing? It was. Remember, it was around 1990, I think. So it, they made. They, it was a cult with a guru, and then his his angle was not sex, but I was waiting for it to surface in the documentary but instead of sex surfacing at the end as the crescendo it was steve bannon 
enters the picture oh. and it's pretty fascinating and it's sort of like Bannon comes through and breaks up this cult for his nefarious obviously nefarious reasons and the people in the documentary are talking about the loss of science and data and I'm like the loss of sex or <laughs> you know like it was it was interesting to see people talking about things that we cherish like uh, math and like uh, climate change but really there was something underneath being like this is a weird vibe in here everyone's very in shape and very close and dating each other and who knows yeah it's like the same kind of feeling maybe when you go back and you realize that the Unabomber was right mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. oh he had this all figured out mm. did he I mean I guess I don't yeah, know what, enough what do you about mean? his, his uh, philosophy oh Huge anti-tech guy. Oh, uh, uh, no! Me Ben thinks he's anti-tech. So oh. let's let's rock. rabidly, let's rabidly rock. anti-tech. He thinks Ooh. he's anti-tech, but in fact, I I feel like we should go back to an agrarian society, and let's get rid of all the professors as well. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm no with more that. intellectuals. Okay. Everyone has to at least be able to touch net. <laughs> Yeah, YMCA rules only in society. <laughs> um, talking about touching net, we got to talk yes. about Trump. We got to talk about Trump, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> I like okay. how we managed to avoid Trump for a solid hour. Should he, we talk about bummer, the doctor, man. Dr. Sean Conley? Sean Connery. So can Conley? we rate, can we rate Con- 007s? Conley? Yeah. I um, have no... Go on. Oh, no, I, no. Go ahead. <laughs> well, this is great radio. I know it's, it's <laughs> tough. Well, I can all see you guys. Like, but, um, I have the worst take with all of this, which is, I am trying to opt out so hard, but this is too funny. It's, it's a, so funny. It's so. It, I mean, I. It's it's truly. I mean, I know it's, and I said this on Twitter last night, uh, not to quote myself, uh, but it's, it's clearly, it's like we're in a, you know, cri- incredible crisis, an emergency moment, but the laughs have been incredible. <laughs> I really haven't laughed this much. I'm giddy. Yeah, I'm just like yeah. laughing so much the last few days. It's, it, it is, it is an emergency pod for a nation. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really, I mean, I just can't get enough. Yeah, when Quo said he was opting out, I kind of was like, oh, I get that, I get that. And then I was taken aback. Like, <laughs> these videos are hilarious. Trump hilarious. heaving. <laughs> Trump <laughs> attempting to Gas. suck some of that precious oxygen <laughs> out of the air. I'm, I'm like, Quo, you're not, you're not seeing this? The, the video with the helicopter, the airwolf music, and he kind of like staggers the lawn. Like, he was proud this, of his country. He, this is, he was overcome with emotion. Thing? Did you see the thing where he came out of Walter Reed, out of the Golden Doors? And, and then he was like, there was somebody that shared this and pointed it out on Twitter where he like, there's a, uh, there's a rail, but he... <laughs> He doesn't want to like hold the rail because Rails it'll make sus. him look weak and yeah, old yeah. and sick. Rails are so sus. And so <laughs> he just like walks down, and as he walks down, he pats, he pat pats like ever so gently, like it. every every it. pace or two, he just gives the a couple pats to the rail, like oddly like, and like inexplicably, a good, like a good dog. Yeah, like good boy, good boy. Um, good rail. It's just everything about it is. <laughs> it reminded me of when he. What was it? This was only a month ago, maybe, but he came off a stage and there was a ramp mm-hmm. and oh, he yeah, like sort yeah. of like he sort of galloped down like and then he tweeted something about how people said that he was like tum- tumbling or or sort of like stumbling. And then he was like, no, in fact, I like I ran down it. Momentum. <laughs> Exclamation point. That was definitely two weeks or six months ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I love how everyone's like, this is shot in Freud. You're just laughing at someone else's expense. I'm like, well, yeah. Like, I mean, this is obviously. exactly what I'm doing. Well, if anyone deserves it, I mean, honestly. Like, this is, is he is so dangerous to public yeah. health. I mean, I'm not even talking about his actual policies, which have been nil, <laughs> you know, or like, nothing, you know, nothing. or just, 
or, or his, you know, active encouragement of op- reopening and, and all of that. And, but just in his own person, in his own example, he's endangering millions. Like, it's unbelievable. And, of course, on he the has, micro level, endangering, like, the, the White House. But he has COVID, and he's riding around in cars. It's insane. Uh, yeah, like that's on the micro COVID. level. Like, he's literally, he's literally killing people with his bare hands. Like, he gave everyone COVID. <laughs> It's insane. Like all of his friends. <laughs> like you gave all of your buddies COVID. You're not even ashamed. No, he's like... like Rudy Giuliani is going to perish of COVID <laughs> because you gave it to him. No, not Rudy. Save Rudy. America's mayor. <laughs> Yo, that he's, dead he's hand on is Fox amazing. coughing up a lung because yeah. you poisoned him with the Rona. <laughs> Rudy's dead hand, man. That is my favorite <laughs> meme. That's, it was his hand was blue. That's some makeup job they do. Again, this is deep wait. I don't stuff, know right? if I saw this. What are you guys? There's a, something about his hand. There's footage of a him. little blue hand. <laughs> yeah, there's footage of him talking. I believe on Fox. Dorian's his, red hand. <laughs> yeah. This and is the it, coughing interview. Yeah, and his face was you know a bright orange like they are, and he goes to scratch his face, and his hand is like a a corpse. <laughs> It's got a tint of blue to it. I'm like, this is amazing. If someone's holding like a severed hand, a this severed is, dead hand. This is unfair. He was wearing these new APC denim gloves. <laughs> right. Don't wash them. Don't wash them. Everyone's it's doing it. Are they in? Them. Are they already out? I can't we'll, tell. We'll buy them back from you. <laughs> <laughs> After you die of COVID. My culture is not a denim glove costume. <laughs> no, but honestly, it's just so, I don't know if you saw this uh, footage where like Rudy is basically wiping himself, patting himself down <laughs> with a you know a tiny handkerchief, like uh, you know like spitting into it, essentially sneezing, like doing everything he can, oh, like no. sweat. Then he like pats his like sort of pats his his meaty thigh, and then the woman who's sitting next to him, he like strokes her arm in a which looks like he's like smearing a booger essentially on her arm. Ugh, I got COVID all over my hands. And then he mm. like leans in for a sweet whisper. <laughs> and it's just oh, the whole thing amazing. is just amazing. so amazing. It's it's just pure comedy. Then he licks her eyeball. <laughs> uh. Yeah. He cleans it from the filth that she has seen in this, you know, post industrial society, just like on a clockwork orange. <laughs> Well, when you've they, lived a thousand years on Earth, you think nothing can beat you, right? Like, there's blood I think everywhere, that's part of it. So, I think that's yeah. part of it. But there's also certainly, like, the hubris and the shamelessness is simply stunning. Yeah. Well, the debate practice room seems to be as much of... That seems to be, like, the real crucible for COVID here, right? Like, it got spread around at the, the Rose Garden ceremony. Yeah. But the, the the debate practice crew, they every single one of them <laughs> going has down. COVID. They all do, except for Rudy thus far. So Rudy either has already had it or has it now. It's one of those two. You were not in that debate prep room, sitting at a table. With Chris with Christie. This, yeah, with Chris Christie, the super <laughs> spreaders. Like the, that entire gang all has COVID. Like you couldn't have emerged unscathed unless Rudy had COVID like five months ago in which the gang that. has covid <laughs> it's like amazing. like gang gang yeah, gang full, gang full yeah. gang has covid <laughs> like you were, like that room that was some crazy shit man wow. every single person in that room it was four days of debate prep just passing covid back and forth <laughs> like a blunt <laughs> <laughs> no it's Chris, really Viet- yeah. it's really vietnam it's really like it's like it's like being in the in the boats you know it's just like really yeah like a like apocalypse COVID. Just bong hits of COVID. <laughs> Shout out to Chris Christie, whose entire life is like rut row. Like everything <laughs> about him is like, oh no. Oh my like, shit. Respect, Chris Christie. You are, you are, if not anything but predictable. I mm. cannot separate him from Bobby Bacala. Oh my God. They look so much alike. I, I, I can't do it. It's I'm just like, so... first he dates Janice, now he has COVID. <laughs> When will he win? <laughs> Classic Bobby. <laughs> oh my god, it's so funny. It's true. He looks so much like him. Yeah. And you and know I, Paul yeah. Manafort looks like um Paul Looks's Servino good. in Goodfellas. Oh. Like if you really think yeah. about it. Yeah. 
we've mentioned this before a few times, but it's incredible how many components out of this right wing evil factory are all from New York and the tri state area. We think of the Republican Party yeah. in many ways as being red states, the deep south. It's like, yeah. nah, it's kind of like outer borough in Long Island. It's like, really like interesting. Like so many of them, like all the people we're mentioning for the most part. Yeah. Then like, like Kellyanne Conway, uh, she's from New York as well. Like it's Bill O'Reilly, yeah. Hannity. It's, Fox it's tapes like this, in Times Square. I think right? it's also why we're so interested in, I mean, obviously we're interested in it because it's like the fate, the fate of the free world like, lies, <laughs> lies in the The end balance. of democracy. But um, I just like, mean, sure, sure, I just sure, mean yeah, kind that. of culturally, <laughs> like, I'm obviously more interested in these people than I am like Mitch McConnell. You know what I mean? I mean, just culture. I'm not talking mm-hmm. about like the political importance or influence that whoever has in this group. But it's just like one of the reasons that this administration has been such a boon, like comedy wise, is just that there's just something inherently funny about these like tri-state type <laughs> sleazeballs, you know? Like you love Michael Cohen. Yeah, like I love Michael oh, Cohen. Right. Um, it's just like it's just like ce- it's it's central casting, you know. It's just like really, it's just like yeah, it's just like we love like. It's very much Law and Order. Law and Order, interesting. Because they're all set in New York City, and it's these all, oh, a crooked lawyer, a, a nefarious financial yes. guy, and that series intentionally does not focus on like street crime necessarily it's more about like trying to come up with stories that that mirror the headlines yes. and then throw a murder in the mix yes and yes. That, that's exactly who all these guys are yeah well, yeah the guy oh, from new jersey has to be fat like we can't cast a skinny yeah. new jersey guy oh it's a scummy drywall guy who runs a i don't know a, a paving company from <laughs> bay ridge like oh yeah 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 that's trump's dude yep, yep yeah that's him. <laughs> Wasn't this that the same guy who was also like the Teamster dude, who's uh, also yeah. the drywall guy? Last oh, the, season he was yeah. Yeah. the parking lot magnate from Sheep's Head Bay. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's Trump's lawyer. <laughs> oh, it's just incredible. It's it is just incredible. incredible. And then when you get to like the McConnell's, right? And then as soon as you peel it away, it gets super scary. Like Kentucky has like loomed over our lives for too long. Yeah, and also because for me as well is that the people you know the people who are from the tri-state area, they're not even if they're uh, Christian or like nominally Christian. You know, you know they don't care. You know they've like you know like paid for like a trillion abortions and they're like totally like they could care less about religion uh and they don't even really talk that much about it or it's more like a fig leaf but then when you get into it's just i think my my lack of understanding of like christianity (laughs) and you know sort of like the the heartland of america also contributes to the fact that i'm just like i'll always prefer like hearing about like you know, didn't... you want a vending machine magnate from Maspeth. Exactly. Those are my people. <laughs> <laughs> that big vending machine magistrate from Maspeth Energy. <laughs> so, last episode, I went on some conspiratorial. Rants. Oh yeah, classic. I didn't episode. say I believe them. I said I'm just asking questions. Okay. It was it was the perfect pod, Nomi. Just so you know. Okay. Yeah, it was perfect. And. and they involve Trump not really having COVID, that this could be a ruse. Oh, right, right, a hoax. <laughs> I've the seen people hoax. still saying that right now, which I, I I, no longer, I never believed by no longer mm. even entertaining yeah. for the most part. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you gave it a part. shot. Beautiful. You shot your shot. What's our theory now? Do we have a, a new alternate theory to what's being presented or an alternate theory at all because nothing at this point is actually being presented as believable. I think it's chaos. Like I think he is, and this is, I I think it seems like a direct line from the way he has been running the administration, Mm -hmm. you know, all along is that he is a terrifying bully. Everyone around him is like either a pussy or kind of like shutting up for their own benefit or maybe both, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And 
he is it's seemingly directing his own at least partly his own uh his own treatment like i don't think like there's no reason to release someone so quickly from the hospital right i mean uh right all all of the information we're getting is compromised yeah there's nothing that is and so it seems he probably i mean i don't know but it like one one possibility is that he like you know insisted because he's obsessed with showing strength and not being perceived as weak or he is like no i'm gonna i'm just gonna like discharge me from the hospital i'm going back to work and everyone's like okay mr president like whatever you say and then there's the question of whether the steroids he's been giving are having a euphoric effect i think and, i oh, think they sure. are for sure I, I've, yeah. I've spoken to people who have used Same. steroids for medical reasons and yeah I don't know if either of you guys have, but they've said this is Before true. You feel yeah. incredible. You, I have you, it. And if you I have the, if you can say, "All right, all right, fuckers, I'm going home," and they have to listen to you yeah. because you're the president, and you're like, "I don't think that's a great idea." He's, I said, "We're going home, fuckers." Yeah, well, that's what I people guess have you told fuckers me. Are going home. A couple of friends of who have taken uh, steroids for like you know asthma or uh, you know um mm, uh, weightlifting pneumonia pneumonia <laughs> hitting baseballs yeah um have told me that it's very it's a very uh, extreme effect that it feels like speed i guess and it's very like you feel, sounds fun um so i can totally see you know him saying i feel better than i have in 20 years it's a classic you know i mean i i once read <laughs> <laughs> uh, a trashy biography of the Kennedy White House. And, you know, the whole thing that Kennedy and Jackie were speed addicts, right? Because they mm, had about this. the doctor, Dr. Max Jacobs, who was the same doctor who would who would inject, like, you know, Edie Sedgwick, like all the factory people and, like, Joel <laughs> Schumacher, may you rest <laughs> in peace. And, like, you know, society, like... Um, society society people rich people and also sort of artsy people he would also travel with kennedy and jackie and you know it was supposedly vitamin shots but it was speed and I feel uh, as good as i have since bennies were outlawed <laughs> and uh and he would inject them you know and it would be like you know kennedy had back pains or he had like a sore throat or he had like you know whatever it is and it would be like doctor i need like you know and it and it's and at one point i think the commitment to the president was too much for the doctor and he tended his resignation and kennedy took the letter this is all based on some trashy biography i read when i was like 16 but i remember it and he took the took the resignation letter and he tore it up laughing and said ha ha you're not you're not going anywhere dr jacobs can you, can you do that again though he said <laughs> he said ha ha <laughs> <laughs> anyway so i think um and that was of course at the time kept totally under wraps and you know people but i i, I feel like you know there is a history of course of, of presidents getting what they want you know medically um and but now we're dealing with COVID, and with like an old insane president. And I definitely think the, I mean, what do I know? But it seems that the meds are playing a part in this like quick recovery and seeming, you know, energy and all of that. Well, there was the whole book that came out a couple of years ago about how oh, Hitler and uh, I love the that Nazis book. were just chugging, yeah. chugging. Mm -hmm. speed all types of stuff i actually remember yeah. reading about it in the new yorker but i have not Both read the of actual you read? book jesus no, this I... was years ago Quo. Okay. i, I haven't the, i haven't read, read in years <laughs> i i i actually read the book the book is very interesting it was so i think the way you know i read it yeah like two two three years ago whenever it came out and um so basically i think the argument was that the army was operating on speed and Hitler was addicted to dope, <laughs> uh, especially in his later years, like in the Eagle's Nest and stuff. So, like, I think Whoa, the army is so crazy. 
the army was operating on enormous amounts of amphetamines, which were, you know, putting them at risk and making them take needless, you know, and, and making them like insane, essentially. And, um, and Hitler himself was actually like a morphine addict. I feel like the untold story of many parts of history like this are just drugs and alcohol. Like, was the French Revolution just fueled by wine? Mm. Like, sure. Mm. Class. Anger. <laughs> but, like, were they just drunk as shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yo, what happened last night? <laughs> uh, well, I think was there a be, revolution? I think we beheaded some people. It's like crazy. Ooh. Again? <laughs> <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> I um, mean, it's true. I mean... I, we always know me. We always love to do this, and like, well, maybe I always love to do this. Like, there's eras of rap music that you can kind of uh, pair up with the drug of choice. Sure. And you know, the '90s was cocaine and crack, and you can kind of hear that in the beats and the cadence and the the sound of the music. Yeah. And when weed comes in the picture, and then like hallucinogenics and Molly and all that, you can kind of yeah. Well, certainly the music the of the last few, the rap of the last few years is all like downers and. Mm-hmm. Um, syrup uh, made, and, made for an opioid crisis yeah. yeah for sure and you know like it reminds me of grunge we're back to grunge right but yeah it, it's my it's my preference like to hear these kinds of sounds but uh yeah. it's just directly related to policy and like the drug of choice what is your musical drug of choice quo are you are you an opioid listener yeah i like music that's kind of has that weird dirty downer vibe for sure like i love dubstep but that's not the right one i've been thinking a lot about dubstep. you're just getting this back to dizzy rascal i can see what you're doing do you remember jungle do i remember jungle half of our pods talk about jungle oh my god (laughs) you mean the second like so my theory is music started with drum and bass Mm -hmm. so that's the beginning of music (laughs) and everything that happens afterwards and you know, Jungle was right there. Maybe you know, the original Jungle was earlier. I know, but um, I always think. And excuse me, Ben. I've always said that. I say this on every pod. That's fair. I expect tomorrow Jungle to hit, and Jungle's been out for decades now. But I expect music to evolve towards Jungle, and I'm still patiently waiting. I was at the Lot Radio. <laughs> yes. A place that all of us have been. Cool. You've been there, right? Not as much as you, Kings, but like, I've, I've, I know what you're talking about. Uh, it's a place in Brooklyn, an outdoor area that has a internet radio station inside of a shipping container. And I was there and a few of our friends were DJing, this maybe a year and change ago, and they were playing Jungle and it sounded great. And my mind was right there with you, Quo. I was like, this mm-hmm. is next up. This is next. It's, we're, we're entering the, uh, Jungle back. It is the perfect Ooh. music to me. Um, I DJed the lot once, and that's when Lil B, before Lil, I mean, ooh, Lil Peep died, I just mm. played a Lil Peep rock block, and I was I got yelled at. Really? It, it, it was a little bit of a downer, even though it was 11 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> they were like, "That's that was hard, man. I'm like, I know, I know. It's Gus. <laughs> May you rest in peace. Yeah, man, and uh, that was that was kind of the end of my DJing life a little bit that put a nail in that coffin Rest you're a piece. legendary dj though at lit wednesday nights wow monday monday, nights. monday, nights. monday nights. but monday. i used to play like at least 20 minutes straight of jungle which didn't go over great but it was like 3 a.m so it was fine are you but mentioned I'll, I'll, in uh, meet me in the bathroom probably not probably not but it was there uh we used to do a party called hugs and it was at some point it was popping as the kids would say but i don't know man it wasn't for me the nights were too late you'd have to wait till 5 a.m to get handed like 60 (laughs) dollars and then wake up the next day and just like wonder if you had just been involved in a french revolution right i mean i I will say that was that was my favorite night at lit though i like mondays and wednesdays yeah uh shout out to harley and cassie who did wednesdays and we used to trade dj night so if i didn't want to do monday we used to swap but uh it was basically and and, and jordan who was on vacation 
was our trusty was bartender. bartender. So like we, the cookies crew wow. was deep, in that room on deep. Wednesday nights, and a lot of times on Monday nights. Yeah, and Jungle, I tried to, I tried to make Jungle work, but <laughs> it didn't quite happen. Drum and bass too. That's a that's a tough one, um, but maybe next year it'll be all the rage. How about trip hop? Okay. Now, <laughs> now you're just fucking with me. They I were was... playing. They, I, I've been doing this. Uh, I again, this is something I've been talking about on Twitter. I've been doing this exercise class, the class, ah. straight out of Tribeca. This sounds like uh, and a cult. And no. yeah, it's a little bit of a cult. And uh, but they played Karma Coma the oh other my day. God. Yeah. Massive Attack was a Massive big Attack. deal. I saw Massive Attack in concert. What era? Do you remember, like, what year? Yeah, this was, they came to Israel, actually. So this was a little, this was probably, in, I want to say, 1999, maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was maybe when they had that big hit, that house, the show House, kind of used for their theme music. Unfinished uh, Sympathy, or and, and what was it called, like? It was, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really hurt me, baby. (laughs) How can you have a day without a night? Yeah. Yeah. I I always tell this story, but I I went to a Knicks game and I saw the Bulls play. And there was a player on the the Bulls called Bison Dele. So Mm -hmm. the the Bulls handle, rest in peace, Bison. The Bulls, who was, that's a very fascinating story outside of this, but they handled the Knicks and me and my buddy went straight to other music to go shop for trip hop records. And who's there but Bison Dele buying trip hop <gasps> records. No. Yeah. And he, he went through a lot in his life, but he basically asked other music being like, I like massive attack. Can I buy all their records and everything that sounds like it? And in his ginormous NBA hands, he was holding the entire history of trip hop in like his, gi- and it looked so tiny. Because it's like <laughs> there were like forty CDs that he was just like, yeah, I'll take them all. Oh, that's I'm like, amazing. That's a whole history of trip hop, sir. Wow. And he walked out with it. It was kind of an amazing thing. I was geeked. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. He ended up being murdered by his brother-in-law on a boat for insurance money. No. Weird story. I believe they made like an. It wasn't unsolved mysteries, but one of those kind of shows. Uh. Maybe it was Unsolved Mysteries. I don't know. One of the reality crime murder shows did one on the death of, of Bison Daly. It was formerly is, Brian Williams. Yeah. Which, they, yeah, they were traveling around the world on a boat. And I think his brother murdered both him and his girlfriend. Oh, I, I don't remember the details. But he, so apparently, so I asked the other music guys if he comes in a lot. And they said every time he's in town, he comes through and just asked them what he should be listening to. That's and really it was all, sweet. Yeah, and it was all down, sullen music. Like, he was a melancholy dude, apparently. Yeah. How are record stores doing in the COVID era? As <laughs> someone who kind of stopped purchasing music? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. Not good, man. Not, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, would I guess don't know not for good. sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, the amount of shopping I do now outside of groceries is almost non-existent. Except right. for cookies, hoops, sweatshirts, hats, and... To... All available for order. Yes, Oh, exactly. right, which are on the cookies, hoops website. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, <laughs> online shopping, sure. But in terms of, like, going to a store that's open and buying, like, a shirt or buying yeah. a record, it just feels very foreign to our day-to-day lives. It's like, okay, you'll go to the pharmacy, you'll go to the bank, yeah. you'll go to the grocery store... But I don't know, I, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, I was in the city and I saw people lining up with their masks on to go into the uh, Louis Vuitton store. Huh. Mm. And I was, like, I, I was like, great, that's a good sign. Also weird to me. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm certain it's happening. Yeah. Like, aren't people, is, are the Supreme stores back open? I walked by Probably. yesterday and it was wide open. The doors were flung open in a beautiful fall day and it was empty, but there was no drop, so it's hard to tell. Right. What about yeah, the I don't Cole know Hans about how... Slack collaboration? Are people lining up for that one. 
You guys I heard think... about this? No, what is that one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't Wait, hear the collaboration that. between Slack and what? And who? Cole Haan. <laughs> no. Yeah, man. What? It's, it's insane. Yeah, they're like, keep your alerts on, dropping. And everyone's like, okay, we are kind of ready for a tech slash oh, yeah. Cole Haan shoe drop, sneaker no, drop. No, uh, no. I'm that's, excited that's for one it. Of... <laughs> I, for one, I am for looking one, forward to it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm not really ready for the the tech fashion brand no, mashups. No, no, no. That's a, a, a style of acid jazz that I'm not pre- prepared no. for. Oh, it's some oh. Jazzmatazz 3. Acid More jazz. Jazzmatazz, yeah. Wow. Um, I, I want to talk some hoops with Nomi. Oh, okay. W- <laughs> Nomi, are you rooting for the Heat? Or the so, Cavaliers. So yeah, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, the the, so so that's the thing. I'm confused. As I said at the beginning, uh, not you know an hour and a half ago, I my impulse, like first I had like the the issue of, I mean the last year I when I was like okay I need to get into basketball maybe I'll get into basketball I was like okay L A is like a classic choice for me. Um, and then I have a friend who's a big Clippers fan, and she was like, "Don't go with the Lakers, go with the Clippers. It's an exci- it's like newer, it's exciting, it's where the action is." It is um, where the action was. Right, right. Um, but the Lakers are a classic. You know, I mean, I remember the Lakers. It's your team. Yeah, you're and day, I just remember it from one. the '80s. I'm a day one. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so I was like, okay, fine, the Lakers. And then we went to the game, and it was really exciting. And it was really exciting uh, to see LeBron and like, um, yeah. you know, all of that. Yeah. But now that but you, you're confronted now with a binary, I'm confronted with the, a binary. You have the Lakers and you have the Heat. Yes. Los Angeles versus Miami. Yeah. At present, following Game Three, in which. Dr. James Naismith Buckets of the Heat scored 40 points in a triple-double. The series is now Lakers two games to the Heat one, with the next game happening tonight. Okay. Are you rooting for your Lakers to close this out, or are you rooting for the Heat to tie it up? This is a really difficult question. (laughs) How far does your sportswomanship go? What would make you guys happy? Heat. We're Heat Day One, so as as a Heat Day One. Yeah. So like Andrew is. I am not even worried. It's going to be tied up, but I want, I want selfishly, I want Nomi to get into it more because there's some characters on the Heat that I think you would love. So Cat has been tweeting about Jimmy Butler, and I one the one thing I know about Jimmy Butler is that in the bubble he has been making coffee and selling it for twenty dollars. Big face coffee. So that's what I know. And mm-hmm. I, I, so I, I realize that's like a big character that I should know more about. It's a sore spot for Ben because his beloved Sixers kind of let him go for nothing. Now he's flourishing in mm. Da Boca Vista in, in <laughs> da retirement. Da Boca Vista. <laughs> well, it's not a sore spot for me because I love Jimmy Buckets. I think he's great. It's everyone only, everyone a, with a brain has It's loves. a source of irritation right. that the team I liked yeah. did not offer him a contract. But I am happy to see him thrive. I also do love LeBron James. This is one of the few finals I can think of where I don't have a particular rooting interest. If the series ended up tied up three games to three. Hmm, someone's not a day one. Jeez, it's heat. And Come on, man. And we're, but I also care about LeBron's legacy. Well, against, you want against Jordan, so like there's there's a, there's a few different and Kobe agendas can, here. Kobe's yeah. not Kobe. even in the conversation, but this diminishes Kobe's narrative for sure. Yes. So if you have, I won't know who I really want to win unless it's Game Seven entering the fourth quarter. Then I'll be forced into a rooting interest. At now, there's not a gun to my head, so I just can't care enough to take a side. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. I, another thing that I wanted to say is that one thing I liked is that we went to the game and they called it the Lake Show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, awesome. and that, <laughs> it's awesome. and that, yeah, that's it. That's all I, that's all I have to say. <laughs> and that attracted me. I'm a woman of words. Mm-hmm. What can mm-hmm. I say? And uh, yeah, it was it was pretty exciting. And the 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 Staples Center. You know, it's just for me. Los Angeles is is uh, 
you know, it's a thicket of signifiers more than it is uh, mm. more than it is a city. You know, yeah. so I hear. But Staples what about Center. Miami? I don't like Miami so much. <sighs> Are you saying that Miami is not a thicket of signifiers? <laughs> it when sure you is. enter Miami, when you when you but, drive into Miami, there's a huge sign that says "thicket of <laughs> signifiers, signifiers now entering." But, they were debating but, to call them the heat or the signifiers. The but Miami so signifiers. I, I, you know, Miami, I, I have enjoyed it. Like it's an interesting city to me, but I don't feel close to it at all, and it doesn't feel like. Similarly to Los Angeles, it feels like the opposite of me, but not in an opposite, opposites attract way. <laughs> like I can sort of more or less take it or leave it. You know, I, I am like, I find it like curious, but not attractive, I mm. guess. It took me a little while to warm up to Miami. I used to only go down there for like Art Basel, which is a different version right. of Miami than the actual one because it's invaded with new yorkers and it's yeah. more or less seeing all of your friends yes in a warmer environment at parties where you're drinking for free and it's very easy to say miami is sick yeah. but after meeting more people who live down there and going back a few times when it wasn't during basel mm -hmm. made me appreciate miami for being a weird and unique american city i mean well. it is a weird I'm, I'm saying it's curious to me like it's interesting to me it's a weird and unique american city but i'm not um <laughs> Like, I don't want to, like, swallow it whole as I do Los Angeles, I guess. I agree. I'm with Nomi on this. Um, the cultural contributions of Miami have been huge. Miami Vice, Gloria Stefan. Jennifer Lopez is from New York, but put her in there. <laughs> Pitbull. Hey, you know. That was the worst credit ever. <laughs> hey. Oh. Dolly. Pitbull, Mr. Worldwide. Mr. Uh, Worldwide. Jennifer Lopez, who's not from there. Um, <laughs> Which is to my point, because L.A. Fat Joe, who's yeah. from New York. Uh, <laughs> There's just no comparison of Miami to L.A. culturally. I Versace, agree. the Versace mansion, Versace, Huge. the Versace Huge. murder. Huge. Yeah. Uh, L.A. Ocean has Drive. a much larger imprint and a, and a much higher ceiling. Mm. Ceiling is much higher. Was and Luel, for me is culture. Luel Day. Like L.A. is yeah. culture for me. Like it's very, I mean, even though it's like obviously has contributed a ton, like endless like trash um mm. it's also it's just like endlessly interesting like l literature wise like it's a city that even if it doesn't read it's like a it's a city that has been written about so much and it's just, well, everyone uh, who leaves new york goes to la and writes about it there aren't as many who go to miami and write about it <laughs> right yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, right. Nomi, I have this theory that the success of the Lakers in mm -hmm. the 80s, some of the 90s, and maybe now, mm -hmm. has ruined L.A. This is a really loose, loose theory. Okay. But, well, well, let's explain it here. Okay. So, so I think even mo the most casual fan would gravitate towards uh, I mean, Magic Johnson in the finals. And it seems like a cultural event, even though yes. someone may not be an NBA fanatic. And I mean, it was I a think, huge... It was a huge uh, team like i, rem I remember mm -hmm. I, in the it was 80s a cultural phenomenon yeah and the success of those teams and then you enter the kobe era with shaquille o'neal and pal gasol that sustained success has shaped the way that city i think talks and behaves mm -hmm. and and i i can't really pinpoint the exact cultural influence it has but there's a distinct kind of entitlement's the wrong word because i don't even think that's a bad feeling to have swagger but like a there sort of is smugness smugness swagger there is a, a, a swag that that breathes out of new uh la that doesn't occur in new york anymore because we've had so many failures right yeah and i think the story of new york since 2000 is a sad one and the story of la since 2000 is probably like la is going to be la we're kind of sick right yeah the Lakers are the best argument for L.A.'s victory, and it does go back decades. If you look at the, the 80s, yeah. you know, the 90s, the Lakers went to nine finals. They won five of them, and that was even before Kobe and Shaq. They, that is what they can hang their hat on. They didn't even have a football team for a while if we're talking about sports. I don't even know if they have one now. Because they got I don't, the Rams uh, you know, and the Chargers. Football. But – 
if you were going to say what do Los Angeles, Los Angelinos mm-hmm. have over New Yorkers, the number one thing you could say if you were going to make a little you chart, know, a chart, you'd be like, well, the Lakers, they have a m- magical basketball franchise that breeds championships. Yeah. And the Knicks have sucked and been the losingest team in the NBA literally for the last two decades. I think that would Not kind of be up there with weather, if you believe that, which yeah. no one does, which no one says anymore. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like that's over. Once the fire started, it was 110 degrees. <laughs> it, it, it's like, like hell on like, earth. Yeah. yeah, that weather argument does not fly anymore. They haven't yeah. even produced that many good musicians since mm, the like the early aughts. I mean, occasionally Kendrick Lamar is huge for sure, but but right, they have not had a cultural imprint in music necessarily in. I mean, food, maybe you could argue. That, that, food, that's for one sure, that I think, yeah. Yep. People would say now that Roy Los Choi. Angeles yeah. and California food, just mm-hmm. the growing season is, is, is superior. And, and there's more space. It doesn't cost as much, and you can be more ambitious. I think there's good arguments for food. But those would kind of be your argu- your, your, your main, the, the, the pillars of your Los Angeles pride would be Lakers, mm-hmm. food. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Done and done. Done and Sucks. done. And of course, <laughs> Not the, the entertainment industry. But that also has been kind of equalized a little bit. Right? A little Not- bit, yeah. Not totally. You're so. I mean, I love Hollywood, and yeah. it's funny to be a fan of movies. And it took me a while to realize what Hollywood was. It wasn't just I'm watching a movie. There's Hollywood has a vision and a way of telling stories. Because when yeah. you watch foreign movies they're like oh this is not hollywood yeah (laughs) and and if you live in los angeles and you're not involved in the film industry then who cares are we excited for the new paul thomas anderson movie do you guys know about it so he's shooting it now and it's about so just from like the log line quote unquote or it's it's about a child star in the 70s lives in the valley that's kind of like that child genius and magnolia vibe huh remember that that yeah. quiz show kid yeah but i think like an actor mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. uh anyway i'm well, the answer hopeful. is yes i'm i'm excited about it i'm yeah. excited for all movies i want them to come back like can we get tenant on Oof. pay-per-view please Oof. is tenant even supposed to be good uh, I love all of his movies, and it was a flop, but, like, you know, they announced that all lows are closing indefinitely. It's kind of like a sad product of the vid, but, like, I think it only grossed under $50 million. I-, I love all of his movies. I think all of his movies are really underrated. Interstellar is unwatchable because it's too sad, but if you get through it, it's, like, one of the best movies I've ever seen. I haven't watched it. It's too sad. It's just way too sad. <laughs> Like, you end up emoting for a bunch of squares that are this robot. Like, he's the most, like, endearing character in the whole thing, and he suffers quite a bit. Mm-hmm. It sucks. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> yeah. We have okay, enough out, suffering. <laughs> it's like Marley and me. It's unwatchable. They're traps. First, it's I like... want our president to be okay. Then I can watch it. <laughs> <laughs> just get that breathing under control. Yeah, just slightly, get that breathing under control. labored. <laughs> I, I was picking up some food from a um, a restaurant called Ada in Queens, which is really good, really good spot. And I went inside to pick it up, which is different from in the past when you'd pick it up right at the entrance during, you know, April, March, whatever, the last few months. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time I've actually been into a place in New York where I've seen people sitting inside of a restaurant. Oh, wow. And there's only probably eight people in there Mm -hmm. you know I I didn't count but it was seven to ten it was not many yeah and they were you know I guess as spaced out as you could be in a a very small place wasn't really ready for that site it's weird (laughs) it 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 felt weird and it felt taboo yeah in a way that I mean it has started I did not expect to react like that I was like oh my good lord there's people in here without masks on and they're eating food It has started to happen to me when I was, when I've been looking at shows, watching like a TV show that, you know, is obviously was shot before COVID and it also is not in the universe of COVID and people there are like not wearing masks and like touching each other. It's very, it's, it's started to be a little odd to me. 
you know, that there's this whole world of people. Yeah, like a restaurant scene or whatever. Yeah. I so was I, I saw that movie Twenty One Bridges featuring Rest in Peace, Chadwick Boseman. Oh, and okay. it's not a great movie and it is kind of tough to watch and I pounded the keyboard on Twitter about it and a buddy kind of reframed it for me to your point and he was like think about that it, it's set in modern times like 2018 2019 mm -hmm. and he was like think about that as a time capsule style wise uh, culture wise that we'll never see again and it was only like a year ago and there's no movies like that that like take place now and he's like we're gonna look back on that and not recognize it pretty soon I'm already tired of the movies that'll come out in the next three to 20 years about <laughs> during COVID. Oh God. Mm, mm. Or the novel, the novels, the, yeah, mm. all of it. It's a rom-com, but they both wear masks. I'm just like, no, yeah. no, no, I don't want to see that. I don't need it. It's a bank heist, but everybody's wearing masks. <laughs> it's a zombie movie, but not really. Get it? <laughs> and the president's a zombie. And then, He's wearing a mask. <laughs> yeah. And he takes the mask off. I mean, yeah, we've been... I, I, the pop culture COVID, I just don't want it. I, let's, let's go back to 2010, where we were taking these drugs that made us super smart, and we used all of that incredible intelligence to, like, score chicks and make money. And to wear bootcut jeans. <laughs> that are in, out. Uh, Who no knows? One knows? No one knows. <laughs> no one knows. Um, uh, well, you guys. No me. What a, what a day. What it, a perfect it, pot. It happened. It happened. I know. I, I was, you know, like, relentlessness works. Let's, no, me. let's put it this way. Next up, the Safties. <laughs> oh, Josh, oh, yeah. if you're listening. Friends of the pot. Friends Uncut of the pot. jams. Nomi, yes. will you come back on periodically as our culture correspondent? 100%. It would be yes. my honor. Yes. And this is how you end up with yet another perfect pot. I'd love to see it. Yay. Um, Cookies. 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 Cookies.